So we're into the, into the home stretch. Um, how do I manage the side effects of the treatments that I am taking? Uh, many of you in the audience know Nancy Moldauer, who's the nursing director of the kidney cancer program and has been such at uh, UCLA City of Hope and here at Cedar sinai Nancy. Thank you, Dr. Figlin. For, uh, as Dr. F Figlin mentioned earlier today, uh, today's program was a series of questions that we feel we wanted our patients to have answers to. But the number one question that I'm always asked is, how long have I been working with Dr. Figlin? <laughs> so just to uh, set everybody straight, it will be 29 years in March. <laughs> but who's counting? Yeah, who's counting? So I know you know all the names of these drugs. We, uh, they were talked about at, at several time points today. And as I know, many of you are receiving these medications. But what I really wanted to focus on was how we can best prepare you before you start um, embarking on the treatment. So I have about 15 questions. It's going to go fast, and I want to just throw them out there. And as you always do, please let me know what questions I have um, forgotten that are important to you. So I'll start with why is this drug being recommended for me? I think it's important that you know that. I mean, that's the number one question um, as to why your physician is recommending a particular drug. And again, I think what you've heard today, so much evidence as to why one drug over the other, what's first line, what's second line, which leads us to the second um, bullet point, what evidence supports the use of this drug? Why, am I be why is this drug being recommended uh, for the first time that I'm receiving a targeted therapy? And then, of course, should I be considered for a clinical trial? If, ye if yes, which one would you recommend? And if not, please tell me the reasons why. Are there any treatment guidelines associated with the medication? You really need to know what medications you can take with the targeted therapy, which ones are contraindicated. How do these medications work? Is this chemotherapy? Everyone in the audience today I know knows that this is not chemotherapy, but I can't say that it's true for the rest of the patients that I take care of. This is not chemotherapy. It's very different, and the mechanism of action is very different. Is there a role for, combine, for combining treatments? We don't get asked that all that often, but in the past we used to because in the past we were combining a lot of these agents together. But what we found is that they're, they're much more toxic when we put um, two targeted therapies together. And what are the pros and cons of an oral drug versus a drug that's given intravenously? What are the side effects? What can I do to improve them? How long will I be taking this medication? How will I know if it's been successful? Will I be able to travel? Should I continue working? How will this affect the quality of my life? What financial resources are available to me? Is there any special diet I should be on? Can I continue to exercise? How often will I need to see my doctor? When and who do I call if I have a problem? So one of the key items to discuss and I think it's important that you understand what angiogenesis is because it will help you understand the mechanism behind the treatment that you're getting. You need to discuss with your healthcare team a follow-up schedule. Just because we give a prescription and we expect everything, you know, to, like in, within a day or two you're going to get your prescription, it doesn't happen that way. In our practice, we put patients on a very rigid schedule for the first month of treatment and then we follow them very closely with monthly treatments, uh, monthly follow-up visits. You need to share with your physician the past medical history, what current medications you're taking, and if you're going to receive any elective procedures. One of the side effects with these agents is that they can cause some problems with bleeding, so you want to make sure that you stop your medications if you're going to have an elective surgery. But not only are the, the bleeding problems a concern, but we have to be worried about wound healing. So sometimes you have to wait up to 28 days even after a surgical procedure before you would restart. And who do you, again, who do you call for the side effects and how are they going to be managed? What time do I take this medication? Again, what foods can I, should I avoid? And keep a medication and a blood pressure diary. It really helps when you come to have 
when you see your physician and you can show them either the blood pressures from the previous week, the previous month, so that they can look at the records and they can act actually see the numbers. So for some uh, people, and like myself, you know, a picture is very helpful in terms of understanding the mechanism of action. And in this simplified slide, what I just wanted to show you, let's see, oh, let's go back. There's the tumor cell in the center, and we know that tumors can secrete factors that actually promote the growth of blood vessels. And you can see the, the blood vessels kind of opening up towards the tumor, and that's exactly what we tried to prevent by giving you these medications that block the growth of blood vessels to the tumor. And in the second picture, you can see in, in the red uh, boxes, just, here's Temsorolimus, Everolimus, Bevacivimed, Zinitinib, Serafinib, Exitinib, and Fizopinib. And this is a blood vessel. This is a tumor cell. And you can see where these medications, they block all these internal pathways that lead to cell growth and also the formation of new blood vessels. So this is what these drugs do. They actually, you know, they, they're, they're putting the brakes, and as Dr. Figlin often, often says, it's like putting a block on, on the dam so that all these internal growth pathways that the cell knows what to do doesn't get, get the signal. So the tumor doesn't get the nutrients and doesn't grow. It, it's a bit challenging and at the same time frustrating in terms of managing the side effects associated with these medications. We've been prescribing them for a decade now, and I can't say that we f better understand the mechanism of action of why you get these particular side effects. We have some idea, but it, it's not a very good explanation as to why they occur. So I, I can lump in, the, in this column the VEGF uh, medications that will cause a certain collection of side effects. We talked about the skin changes, and we'll, I'll go into that in greater depth, increases in blood pressure, fatigue, soreness of the mouth, change in bowel habits, some laboratory and urine changes, loss of hair color, definitely a change in appetite and taste, and some bleeding. And it doesn't necessarily matter if you're on Sutent or Votrian in terms of developing hand foot. The way in which we treat it is the same. But if you're receiving an mTOR inhibitor on this side, frequently when patients go from uh, the VEGF class to an mTOR, it's a much easier transition in terms of the side effects. But I wanted to point out two side effects that the pneumonitis, and although rare, is something that you need to know about if you're on an mTOR inhibitor. And simply, I, I can describe it as inflammation of the lung tissue. And although rare, when it occurs, it needs to be promptly recognized and treated. And if you develop a cough, a fever, some shortness of breath, you need to bring this to the attention of your physician right away. And the other um, unique side effect associated with the mTOR inhibitors is that you're going to see some changes in your blood chemistries, elevated glucose, lipids, and triglycerides. Again, the, the, this class of medication tends to be a little bit better tolerated than the VEGF inhibitors, but I just wanted, again, to point out these two a little bit different class side effects that um, you, you do need to know about. So we can uh, talk about hypertension, and it pretty much is anticipated with all of the TKIs. Taking a baseline blood pressure is very important. Frequently, we initiate or adjust antihypertensive medication. We, can, we, we try to monitor blood pressure, not always needing to interrupt the dosing of the TKI. And if you bring these, if, if you have a good working relationship with your physician and your team who's taking care of you, you don't necessarily have to interrupt the medications because you're prepared to do some dose adjustments of your um, routine antihypertensive medications. 
This rarely occurs with the mTOR inhibitors. And although we usually see it within the first four weeks of therapy, it definitely can happen sooner, which is why we start the medication, the blood pressure diaries, on the first day of treatment. And also, as mentioned earlier, that hypertension is a biomarker of efficacy in kidney cancer. So if your blood pressure increases, it may mean that it's working. We like to maintain the blood pressure less than 140 over 90. And again, as I mentioned, you, uh, you're going to monitor it very closely during the initial weeks of therapy. There's no specific recommendations as to what antihypertensive to use. Um, and also to anticipate blood pressure changes if your dose of the medication is modified or if there's an interruption in, in uh, your treatment. And there's some really easy blood pressure uh, cuffs on the market today. This is one that you can wear around your wrist, and it does do a very um, accurate uh, blood pressure measurement. And perhaps one of the mechanisms that we know about why these medications cause hypertension, and that would be the effect actually on the arterial walls, and it doesn't allow them to dilate as well when you're taking the TKI. And the blood pressures, uh, what we're measuring is just the force applied to these vessels every time the heart contracts. So we know a little bit about why this occurs, uh, but more importantly, it's the management of it that is number one. So fatigue is a universal symptom with these targeted therapies. And we have treated so many patients through the years and have tried to guide patients as they go through this is that the first couple months or the first couple cycles of this medication will probably be the most intense. And although it's very difficult to kind of accept that when you're starting these medications, they actually, it actually does get better over time. And we have patients now who, beyond years taking these, but generally after the fourth and fifth cycle, they're beginning to feel that the side effects have subsided they're getting back to their baseline, and they're kind of you know, feeling better, and their bodies appear to be adjusted to the side effect. So the fatigue, indeed, will improve. The way in which we manage it, well, we like to screen for other causes if it doesn't go away. We don't want people to kind of just lie around all day, develop some type of walking in the morning, walking in the afternoon. If, if a hike or a long walk for 45 minutes tires you out, then take a 10, 15 minute walk twice a day. So you can kind of conserve your energy. If you're not sleeping at night, let your health uh, team know. When fatigue is, is just so overwhelming, we will interrupt the dose and make a dose modification. Because our goal is to keep you on this medication and we also want to keep you, you know, have a, a good quality of life. The next area of, of side effects are the skin toxicities, and these, can, these are really, um, they range from just a dry, itchy skin where there may or may not be a rash to a full-blown rash on the skin, hand-foot syndrome, hair thinning. Uh, generally speaking, you will not lose your complete head, set of hair when you're on these medications, but thinning can definitely occur. We see changes in the color where the, because you're going to lose your pigmentation. Um, scalp itching and burning, that tends to occur kind of in the beginning of, of the treatment, inflammation of nail beds, and a small incidence of some skin cancers have been noted on patients who have um, been on the TKIs. Here's some pictures, obviously, of hand foot syndrome. And what we notice very frequently is that they seem to appear in the creases of the toes and I'll show you the hands on the next slide. And these are incredibly painful. They seem to occur in the pressure areas, like these could be areas of, of tight-fitting shoes, but also you have to be aware that you know, it, it, it can occur in areas that you may not expect it, so it's very important to carefully examine one's feet. And here's pictures of some hands that had developed some hand foot, again, in the creases, very painful, 
And here's a large um, area of calcification. Well, it looks like it's, the skin becomes very um, hard and uh, looks like a blister, but there's actually no fluid underneath the skin. What's important is to recognize the early signs of a hand foot syndrome. It can be redness, pain, tingling, and it typically can occur as soon as two weeks into the treatment, um, up to maybe six weeks or into the maybe the, you know, sometimes the third cycle. I think we're doing a, a much better job at managing the side effects only because we are much more proactive in working with our, our patients in terms of starting the use of moisturizers early on. And the thicker the moisturizer, the better. Informing you to avoid streams of temperature, pressure, friction to the hands and feet. And whenever possible, use, wear really good shoes and the insoles or gel inserts do help with the hand foot. Other like common sense things, if you, if you develop hand foot on your hands, avoid wearing rings. We don't want the rings to get caught. Avoid wearing tight fitting shoes. Use gloves if you're going to do housework, gardening work. You know, it, it's difficult to limit the amount of exercise that you like to do and the amount of walking. But if your feet are beginning to get painful and if you continue to kind of pound the cement or the, the surface, you're, you're going to have an intensification of the hand foot. Pay attention to signs of infection and um, always use sunblock and avoid uh, direct sun exposure. And if all these preventative measures that we talked about are not successful, then we do have to um, have a treatment interruption and sometimes modify the dose. I'm happy to provide this as a handout to you. Um, these are all uh, different type of products that we use uh, to treat this. Uh, recent, let me go back. Recently, I have, we've been using some prescription ointments that one is called urea cream, the other is clobetasol, and they seem to have some, a little bit more effectiveness in treating some of the uh, very tough calloused areas on the hands and, and feet. But again, a lot of this is our experience and it's anecdotal. We don't have any very good research studies to tell you um, what moisturizer is the best, so it's a lot of trial and error. And here, these are all the products that are over the, the counter. They're not expensive and uh, very helpful in treating this um, side effect. So moving on, um, a lot of patients will complain of or, or develop some GI side effects associated with these medications, the mouth sores, kind of a burning sensation in the mouth, heartburn, taste changes, decrease in appetite, nausea and vomiting actually minimal. Um, it's rare that we ever have to actively treat nausea and vomiting with any type of prescription medications, but there's diarrhea, constipation, although rare, can occur, and then some bleeding um, from the bowel, again, rare. So if you just think of your entire GI tract being um, affected by the TKIs, you can see how these side effects kind of set in. We make recommendations for how to modify your diet. I think you're going to be the best person as to know what foods work and what foods uh, will not. Uh, we recommend always before starting these medications to having over-the-counter Imodium at the house, and we give very specific instructions as to how to use it and also the use of an antacid because there is some heartburn associated with these medications and if we can, you can take some over-the-counter uh, antacids, it definitely does help uh, to alleviate that while you're on the treatment. And here's just some of the over-the-counter medications that um, you, can, you should have at home. And in, in terms of the diarrhea, we talked about the, the Imodium, which is easy for you to obtain, but if that is not effective, then we can uh, prescribe some prescription medicine. But the most important thing is that you need to contact 
your healthcare team when these symptoms occur. We don't like to hear that these symptoms have been occurring and we don't know about it. It's very easy to become dehydrated and it's easy to do this when you're having, you know, eight to 10 episodes of watery diarrhea a day. The other um, area that's very important um, also related to the GI tract is really the condition of, of your mouth. And it's becoming more and more frequent that before you actually start these medications that you visit your dentist and, and have um, a, a, a dental hygienist cleaning of, of your teeth. Because again, we don't like to have to find things out once you're on these medications that you need to have a tooth extracted or you have um, a gum infection Simple things like avoiding alcohol mouthwash. Uh, we can prescribe some uh, mouthwashes that have a little bit of um, anesthetics to it. Probably the best um, uh, measure is just warm water rinses up to six to eight times a day if you're able to do that. Sometimes we have to change to a children's toothpaste that is not as minty or as spicy. And there are some prescription things that we can also recommend when the stomatitis just gets so intense that you can't, um, you know, it, it really affects your eating. Again, here are some, uh, again, over-the-counter, uh, easy interventions that you should have at your disposal while you're on these medications so that you, know, you can be very proactive in um, preventing them. And again, this is one side effect that over time will definitely improve. The major, medicine, uh, the major food that um, should be avoided on most of these medications is grapefruit. And the reason is that it can actually affect the, the level of the TKI, uh, making it a little bit, the, the level a little bit higher and the incidence of side effects greater. And looking at the, the top section, the snitinib, everlimus, exitinib, those can be taken with or without food. It doesn't matter. Snitinib ge generally is taken four weeks on, followed by two weeks of rest. Everlimus is daily dosing. And exitinib is a medication that is actually taken twice a day or every 12 hours. When you're dosing with serafinib or pazopinib, it's a little bit trickier. Uh, it should be taken one hour before or two hours after a meal. So if you're on other medications, you have to kind of fit in when you're going to take this medication in relationship to, to when your meal is going to be. Serafinib is given, uh, taken twice a day and pazopinib once daily. Temsorolimus is given as an IV infusion every week and the combination of bevacivimid and interferon, the bevacivimid is given IV every two weeks whereas the interferon is a sub-Q injection. Some specific side effects associated with the mTOR inhibitors. And, and the first one really deals with temsorolimus, and that's the medication that's given intravenously. And the thing that you would want to know about, and, and the nurses who would be administering this medication to you, would be the possibility of allergic reaction during its infusion. And that could be manifested by feeling short of breath, having some back pain. Um, and these are things that e a nurse would be watching you very carefully and observing you during your first um, infusion with this med medicine. Also lab abnormalities, I mentioned the increased blood sugar, cholesterol, and increase in triglycerides. These are blood tests that should be monitored about once a month, and if you can do it at fasting, that, that's even better. And also, as I mentioned, to always report the new onset of a cough shortness of breath or a fever because we would want to rule out any type of um, inflammation uh, to the lung. So as always, we're trying to improve upon the medications that we have to treat kidney cancer. And with that, always looking at medications that might have a side effect profile that's a little bit better tolerated and at the same time having greater tumor control. We're looking for a prolonged progression for your survival for those patients who are on these medications with metastatic disease, continuing to have tailored treatment options for our patients. And as you, you heard earlier today, the newer treatments being studied, the checkpoint inhibitors or the PD-1 and the vaccines. And maybe in the next year or the year after, when these newer medications are 
approved, I'll be able to have some, interven some nursing interventions for how to take care of the side effects associated with these medications as well. Any questions? Time for a few questions by, for Nancy. You can see that her experience is extraordinary.